Tonight, we venture into one of the many dark corners of humanity's history. I suggest leaving behind your modern burdens and trifling worries, and trade them, if only briefly, for the heavy and often fatal responsibilities of Victorian London. This time period is often dressed up in the attire of aristocrats. We imagine caricatures of wealth and status punctuated by sophisticated gatherings and complex classical music. We envision a renaissance of new artistic styles, architecture, and masquerade balls. But where I'm taking you isn't to the upper echelons of London society, and this story isn't suffocated by perfume. The tale of Eliza Grimwood's murder is steeped in the unfortunate conditions for the majority at that time. The squalor, depravity, and rancid nature of many of London's suburbs were unforgiving and, unfortunately, ubiquitous. The walkways are bordered by derelict buildings, sticking up like rotted teeth into the smogged sky. These rat hovels, if they can even be called that, are often connected via impromptu doorways made by the dwellers, if only to create a passage from one household to the next, in order to share what little resources there are. This, of course, makes cleanliness impossible. Misery and disease propagate with glee, and death, as it were, is having a field day. As the 19th century makes its grand entrance, it demands with it degrees of industry that cannot be afforded without a high price of both mortality and morality. Here, the boroughs of London are dens of refuse and the truly destitute. Here, as soon as a slum is created, that is the first moment it is wretched. But now we shift pace, inching closer to the subject of our story. The night is May 26th of 1838, and the air is permeated with a choking fog. And though it isn't raining, to walk the streets is to breathe in a foul, pungent mist that whispers of a harsher season. You see, winter is a ghost whose hands won't let go of this city. Its icy fingers grip the filth stuck between cobblestones of Waterloo Road and the Lambeth Borough. To even walk the streets is surreal as every step feels something like a nightmare. Wellington Terrace, what today might be an, an apartment complex, hangs over the street with its splintering wood. From a nearby alleyway, a, a silhouette emerges with a slight limp. Everything is in place for the depiction of a perfect gentleman, really. A top hat, a cravat, a button-down shirt. Only, his clothes are hastily thrown on, his collar is misshapen, and his cravat hangs untied around his neck. And there is something dripping from his hands, a substance which drenches his sleeves to such a degree that the frosted air clings to it, sending chills throughout his body despite his heavy coat. It is well past midnight, and the oppressive darkness pressing down on the briskly walking silhouette is rife with danger lurking in nearby alleys. Lucky for him, he is one of the monsters. And though it will be several hours before her body is discovered, that substance on his hands is Eliza Grimwood's blood, the blood of a woman whose story will resonate far beyond the humble streets of Waterloo Road. This is the tale of Eliza Grimwood's murder. And unlike all the other retellings, it in fact contains the perpetrator, his mind, and his motives, and a little piece of his mania. Within every human is some small adoration for horror. Whatever mask we don when we read the morning papers, whether it be shock, fascination, disgust, or disquiet, our eyes never cease to lap up tales of murder. 
no matter how virtuous we are. A part of us, however small, no matter how convoluted or deeply rooted, savors grisly tales of tragedy. I know it's horrible to think so, but it's true, isn't it? And it has always been this way. But for Victorian London, it is an especially highlighted trait. One week before the night of Eliza Grimwood's murder, Gregory Bernard stood over a desk in his office of the news outlet The Satirist. A courier he's just fired leaves his office weeping, slamming the door behind him. In his better days, he might have chased after the boy and beaten him for that, but at this moment, he simply just doesn't have the energy. <laughs> and just beyond the office, a room of journalists, typesetters, and copy editors pretend not to notice the gravity of the transaction. Shepard Smith, a writer of unpopular Penny Dreadfuls for the satirist, uses the opportunity to slip into the office, his fingertips stained gray from ink. The writer folds his arms and leans back against the shut door. We can't go on like this, Shepard, Bernard says. He adjusts his tie, watching his assistant closely. We'll find a way, sir. In the meantime, would you look over the story, Shepard asks, handing him a sheaf of papers. Bernard blinks for a moment, caught between the decision of screaming at Shepard, punching him, or simply kicking him out of the office. Instead, the editor snatches up the papers. Some nerve you have, haven't you? He says through a bemused chuckle. Bernard glances over the story. What is this? He mutters. Some phantasmic tale of ghosts? A local farmer reported some peculiar happenings to the Scotland Yard. Shepard begins with excitement. And Bernard matches it. But not the enthusiasm. Rather, his is an excitement of, well, rage. The editor unleashes a torrent of abuse and screams at Shepard. A tangent so long and insult-ridden that it surprises even the more seasoned workers of the newspaper. Shepard finds himself backed up against the door of the office, blood draining from his skin as he imagines himself alongside that boy courier who'd just been sacked. Out! Bernard roars. Shepard counts his blessings, one of them being his still-secure job. Uh, one that he can't count, however. It is the only draft of that story he was planning to send out for the following weekend. It had been reduced to a heap of torn papers and indiscernible words. Something worse. Something better. Not the meaningless conjectures of a weak-minded boy listening to a farmer's asinine ramblings, Bernard had demanded. Something worse. Something better. So, as much as you know... This is real. I just need to emphasize this part. The next location we're going to is called The Blood Tub. And no, I'm not making this up. I mean, you, you can't make this up. It's ridiculous. This place is called The Blood Tub. Now we're writing about a murder mystery here, and here we are discussing a place called The Blood Tub, so I just, I just needed to put that in there. This is not my, uh, you know, weak cliche ramblings. This place was actually called that. <clears throat> okay, onward. The blood tub was a the... <laughs> it's ridiculous. I can't believe people called it that. It <laughs> All right. It was a theater located on Waterloo Road, a common haunt for Eliza Grimwood. Eliza lived with her cousin, William Hubbard, who, when asked about the habits of his deceased relative, revealed that it was not uncommon for her to leave early in the evening to visit the theater. Oftentimes, she would return around midnight with a gentleman. These visitors, we'll call them, would sometimes share the evening with her twice or more times, but more often than not, you would only see them come around once. The theater earned its name for its reputation of putting on sensational melodramas, though it was renamed, quote, the Royal Victoria Theater, now, today, titled Old Vic. Much simpler. Behind its plain but dignified walls back then, the theater's quality was actually, and surprisingly, superb. Although they sold tickets to everyone from street vendors to sweeps and dustmen, some of the greatest actors of that time were known to play on its modest stage. So it's no wonder that Eliza frequented that theater. Perhaps it was here that she found a sense of comfort, even safety, in her dangerous profession. 
Not only was the theater on her very own street, perhaps it aroused the interest of more discerning individuals, attracted to the venue for its reputation of quality actors. Though the records are sparse, from what we know, Eliza is known to be around 25 years old around this time. I like to think of Eliza as remarkably intelligent. She is somebody who has arrived at the realization that, compared to many, the circumstances of her life are indeed unfortunate, to say the least, but owing to a particular vigor and sense of independence, she decides to take what she can from it. So, you'll have to forgive me, then, for making us return to that evening of May 26th. Eliza struts into the theater once again. The performance that is on display that evening is one that she's already seen before. Nevertheless, as she makes her particular position amongst the crowd discernible, she does what she can to enjoy it. And when a man approaches her through the haze of tobacco smoke, their interaction is brief and specific towards their, let's just say, mutual aims. Am I being subtle enough here? His hand is shaking when he takes hers. Not odd at all, Eliza observes. Most cheating men are nervous, after all. This sort of thing isn't unusual. Guilt always has a way of showing itself one moment or another. The warm soul that she is, Eliza does what she can to ease the gentleman's nerves. But as the night wears on, she realizes that her customer is perhaps as peculiar a person as she is. He is polite yet intense, talkative yet not promiscuous, and hadn't their business been specifically outlined by the subtle gestures of her craft, she wouldn't have known that this man wasn't simply determined to court her. He's all at once a perfect gentleman, and all at once an enigma, and that's what is so unsettling. Nevertheless, after the theater closes and midnight tolls off in the distance, the pair leave the blood tub arm in arm, strolling like any other couple through Waterloo Road. When Eliza ushers the gentleman into her flat, her servant asks her if she'll be needing anything for the evening. The servant peers at the gentleman curiously, but in the darkness of the evening she cannot discern anything more than how well-dressed the guest is. "'You are too kind, Anne,' Eliza replies with a warm nod and smile. "'You run off to bed. We'll take care of ourselves.' And so the servant does just that. But before she does... She waits at the bottom of the stairs, watching as the pair amble up to the bedroom. The servant has a feeling that she hasn't had before. Then the door clicks shut, and though the servant listens for a long while, there is nothing but silence to be heard. And throughout that night, that silence persists, and that stranger which arrived with her will never be observed to leave. He'll excuse himself like a phantom, only he'll be leaving behind a trace and a memory a little too difficult to wash off. The case of Eliza Grimwood is not really strange for those times. What separates it from other murders like hers, yet similarly aligns it with many of the Ripper killings, is that no murderer was named. William Hubbard was an obvious suspect alongside with the gentleman who arrived home with her that evening, but with a lack of evidence for Hubbard, including a lack of motive, really, and no name or footprints to trace for the gentleman, we are left empty-handed. And that is precisely the kind of gruesome mystery that made newspapers sell, even to those who couldn't afford their stories in Victorian London. It wouldn't just be the event itself, it's much more than that. Rather, the victim, whoever it was, would be made into some kind of archetypal character, one that acts as a launching pad for an antagonist, a murderer, maybe the protagonist even, whose story can be told ad infinitum and painted onto countless other gruesome killings coming up short with perpetrators. So, we've arrived. And as much as you may like to shut the door, I think it's pretty clear that you're already in the room with us. Us being Eliza, me, and the stranger, the guest. So, nobody likes this part, but we're here, so 
we might as well get to the end. Pantine scuffed, scratched, bruised, and bloodied. The gentleman stands over the body of Eliza Grimwood, as her final grunts and struggles sputter out like the last embers of a fire. A straight razor is held loosely in his hands, twitching with his quickened pulse. His ears are hammering with adrenaline, and just one floor above, Eliza's cousin is sleeping, unaware of the hellscape beneath him, unaware of the deafening sound of blood pumping through the guest's ears as he takes in what he's just done. A jagged cut has been given to Eliza that stretches from ear to ear. Lacerations decorate her hands, her abdomen. And though the darkness has nullified the effect it would impress on the gentleman's already mangled psyche, the room is bespattered with blood, befitting a slaughterhouse. Investigations say that the wounds on Eliza's hands were issued during a struggle. But if Eliza had longed to struggle, wouldn't she have screamed? Wouldn't that have alerted her cousin, or even her servant? Indeed, I think Eliza had not very long to struggle. After all, the coroner determined that the wound on her neck was the ultimate cause for her death. The rest of the cuts, as was the style for many murderers in that time, were issued post-mortem. So I guess even killers pay attention to what's in vogue. See, what, what I think happened is that these little extra marks were the signatures of a timid writer looking to add something special, something different to the murderous mystery which would act as the seed for his next serial in The Satirist. During this time, newspapers in London were dangerously competitive, and the stories that were selling the most were fictitious tales woven out from true murders, especially those that went unsolved. Such is why Shepard Smith, as he gazes at his fingers and wrists, smudged with the thick substance coating the room, considers that, in the dim lighting, it looks quite similar to the ink which, just days before, stained his skin instead. Indeed, as he strides out from Lambeth Borough, adjusting his top hat and checking his pocket to be certain he hadn't forgotten his pen, he makes a note to emphasize just how nightmarish it must have been for her flatmates to awaken the very next morning to find Eliza there ripped and torn. Something better, something worse, Shepard chuckles to himself. And what better way to write a successful story, he muses, than to manifest it, word for word, cut for cut, with his own hands. If you've made it this far, I really have to thank you for joining me on the very first episode of the Mania podcast. It was so much fun <laughs> tinkering around with these real people. Uh, writing fantastical characters and fictitious characters is, is a treat, but to really get into the lives of people who existed, into the horrors of a true nightmare, was just way too much fun. Um, I guess we should discuss what was bent and what wasn't. Well... Shepard and Bernard were the characters I focused on most with in terms of tweaking, mainly because they were the voices behind the newspapers and editorials that would produce such writings. I didn't exaggerate just how fascinated the Victorian society was with such murders. The, it really was a prime source of entertainment for them, as horrific as that is. So Shepard and Bernard were actual writers who worked at the satirist and the I believe it was Bernard who was the one who wrote many, many stories that revolved around um, Eliza's murderer. I simply switched the names around because it seemed more fitting to have Shepard be the one who did it in the end. In any case, uh, every story has an ending, and I suppose we've found ours here. This podcast was written and produced by Harlequin Grimm. If you would like to support me, you can, well, there's not much to do at this moment. I suppose in the future, there will be some products and things on Patreon, perhaps. But until now, you just relax and enjoy. So, until the next time, my friends.